it didn't listen to me. It walked out of the thicket, it turned around and looked at me. They looked up and in this tree, there was a monkey man. And the monkey man jumped down out of the tree and started running away. And suddenly they're right in front of the car slams on the brakes and manages to stop and he's skidding because it's not quite, you know, um, gravelling. And for literally for about a second and a half, they just stood there because they don't know where to go and you tell them panicking, they're like roof flapping and their, their, their face is like twitching. Welcome back to Bigfoot Society, a podcast where we focus on cryptids, the strange and the unexplained of this world. If you've got a story or something weird to share, send an email over to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support this show, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. And now on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to uh, Mr. Hernando from Florida today, and uh, we had talked back and forth a little bit on TikTok, I believe it was, and uh, he's got some interesting uh, stories to share about uh, Bigfoot. So, Hernando, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. I'm beautiful Sunday here in Florida. Very good. So let's uh, let's get right down to it. So. Uh, Let's start with uh, where would you like to start your your story? We'll we'll start at the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I I'd I'd like to start from just before my father's passing, just a couple of years ago. Um, I was his caretaker in the last year or so of his life. He had come down with uh, pancreatic cancer, and um, he was letting go of a lot of things that he'd experienced in a lifetime. And at the time, um, he, he was aware of, of my interest and, and my activities here in Mayaka in Florida. Um, and he, he wanted to make sure I, I didn't give up as easily as I was wanting to. Out here looking for the skunk ape in the Mayaka State Park and the adjacent area. And as the story goes, um, one day, about two months before he passed away, he, um, you know, I, I told him, you know, I, I, I was kind of at my wit's end. I, I'd, I'd been out there for almost two years, off and on, looking around. I hadn't really seen anything, hadn't heard anything. Um, you know, I'd, I'd seen some footage from some associates of mine that are pretty well-known footage uh, on the Internet. And... Uh, I told him, I said, you know, I, I just feel like I'm wasting my time out there. You know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful setting to be in, but it's just a lot of time to be spent out looking for something that you're just not sure exists. And uh, he, he told me, he said, son, whatever you do, don't give up. These, these things are out there. He said, I have no intention on telling anybody about what actually happened to me in the Pokemon forest? I said, well, what are you, what are you referring to, Dad? He said, well, you were calling 96. You were at work that week. You didn't have the opportunity to come out hunting with me that week. It was a Wednesday in 96, the winter of, of 96. And uh, he was hunting in the same spot. Him and I had both hunted for well over 10 years. I was I was in my early teens when he first started taking me out there, and off and on for for, for many years, both he and I would would have a conversation after coming out of the woods. Did you hear someone walking through the woods? I I told him I said yeah. Oftentimes it, it, I would hear someone walking. It was clearly something on two feet, but we'd never see anything. Well, that Wednesday that I was unable to accompany him hunting. He was hunting in the same spot we had hunted for roughly 12, 12 years. And he said, well, the day I came, came and saw you that afternoon, and I told you I refuse to hunt there anymore, 
and I wouldn't tell you why. He said, I even left my uh, tree climber back there because of what happened. And I said, well, wh what do you mean by that, Dad? He said, son, these things exist, and they're, they're in a lot more places than people even think. The Eastern Shore is kind of an isolated peninsula. You know, I'd, I'd never heard of anybody even mentioning the word Bigfoot on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And, and he continued to tell me, he said, I was in my tree stand that morning. I'd been up there, well, you know, around 4.30, 5 o'clock. And he said, around 7.30, I heard something coming from behind me. And he had his tree stand facing due west on a very large pine tree that was up on a sand hill. And you could kind of see, as, as far as the eye could see, without obstruction from, from other things, like you would on the ground. He was, he was quite high. I'd say probably about 14 or 15 feet up the tree. And he said, I heard it again. He said, I heard footsteps. And it was what sounded like a very large person. And he said, as the footsteps got closer, he said, to my very left, about 25 or 30 yards, wasn't very far. He said, out of my left eye, I saw what I thought was another hunter, which aggravated me quite a bit because, you know, we're pretty far removed into the forest. We rarely saw any other hunters there at all, uh, at least in that section of the forest. And he said, I was watching out of the corner of my eye. I was about to say something because I thought it was another hunter. He said, I turned my head slightly to the left. And he said, it, it looked like a man in a ghillie suit, but very tall. He said, it was, it was probably about seven foot tall. And as he said, as I turned my head further to, to observe it, he said, my tree stand shifted due to the wind. You know, these things can, can, can shift and the tree moves around. He said, it squeaked. He said, when it squeaked, it turned and looked them directly in the eye. And he said, whenever it looked in the, in, in the eye, he realized, that it was not a human. And he said that the overwhelming fear of what I was looking at completely locked me up. He said, son, I've, I've been through two tours in Vietnam and I've never been so frightened. He said, when it looked him in the eye, he said, this thing had red eyes and it was completely covered in hair. And this is when I said, Dad, you, you had a gun in your hand. He said, this thing, if I had shot it, would have definitely climbed the tree and beat me to death with it. He said it was so massive and so scary looking. He said it was, it was quite much like something out of a horror film. And he said, whenever it, it gave him the gaze... And it stared at him for a few moments. And it, it just as quickly as it had turned its head to look at him, it shifted back the way it was going and ran directly through a briar patch that was, frankly, in, in, impenetrable by a human being anyhow. And he said, whenever, whenever I heard no more, you know, no more trees snapping, no debris being stepped on, I immediately climbed down my tree stand and headed the other direction. He said, I, I, after that, I didn't want anything to do with that property. It, it, was, it was intensely frightening. You know, I, I think a lot of people have this impression, well, well, if I got a gun and I'm out there and I see one, I'm going to shoot it. And I think there's something 
primordial in, in a person's brain that stops you from reacting in a, in a, in a logical manner. And, and that's what he, he definitely experienced that day. And it frightened him so much, he, he never returned to get his, his tree climber and refused to ever hunt there again. It's just an absolutely fascinating story. Uh, first, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, his story. Did, did he say anything about uh, if he heard it make any noise at all? Yeah, yes, yes, he did. He, he said when it shifted its gaze and looked at him, and when it shifted its head back away from him, and it started running, he said it sounded like a lion and an elephant at the same time as it was as it was running through that thicket. He said, and it screamed probably as long as he could hear it breaking branches. So, you know, I don't know how many yards that would be, but you know, that it's it's quite a distance before you stop hearing something in the woods anyhow. You know, when when you're in a forest things t tend to amplify in sound. And so I'm assuming he was probably a couple hundred yards away before my father even reacted to get out of the tree stand. And he, he said that sound was, it was absolutely frightening to the bone. Frightening enough that he never went back there again, correct? Correct, correct. He, 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 like I said, you know, the, the tree stand he was in, he had just bought the previous season, and tree climbers at the time were quite expensive. And for him to have left it, not to ever retrieve it, you know, it was surprising to me. He didn't tell me this story until just a couple months before he died. I recall the day because he told me, he said, we're never hunting there again. We, we will never hunt there again. And I asked him, I said, well, why not? And he said, son, we're just not hunting there anymore. And I left it at that. And, you know, I really put no, no thought into it until he told me the story just prior to his death. It's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Did Were there any other stories that came out of the the same area or is that the one uh in, one uh story that well, you've after, heard come out of there he, yeah after he told me this story um i i took the time to kind of look around because like i said i've never i've never heard of anything you know humanoid being sighted on the eastern shore um but as i told you previously um that particular Swamp was widely discussed as being haunted, but no one ever said haunted by who or what. And after hearing this story, I have no doubt that is that is what people probably hear or see in that area, and that's why it was quote unquote haunted. How far back did those uh, accounts that you found through your research uh, go back, roughly? Uh, at, at least several decades. Wow. Several decades. Now, I, I, you know, I didn't research any further than that, but uh, I, when he told me this story, when I started doing research, I know there were other accounts pretty much starting from the northern part of Delaware, which is on the peninsula with, you know, it's Delaware, Maryland, and then Virginia. Uh, you know, a lot of people aren't going to even know what the Eastern Shore is or even where it's at, but it's a peninsula that, that hangs off the East Coast there. When you think of D.C. or Baltimore, where you got the Bay, and then you have the Eastern Shore, which is Delaware, uh, Maryland, and, and a portion of Virginia. And the, the, the few sightings that I'd come across this a cursory, cursory um, search on the internet. It, there were sightings in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia the same year. That is absolutely wild. It, you said 
so you're you're in Florida now, but this is Correct. almost influenced you down there. You say you are you are looking for the skunk ape down in uh, Mayaka State Park, correct? Correct. Correct. So much that I've actually, in the last six months, moved adjacent to, to the state park. Because uh, where I was living here in Florida, which was Bradenton, you know, Bradenton, Sarasota area, that's, that's west of, of, of this Mayaka area. And it, it would take me about an hour to get where I needed to be just before I even got out of my car. Now I'm, you know, it takes me five minutes. And it gives me time to, to re- really focus on what I'm trying to do out there. Uh, personally, I haven't experienced anything. I, I've come across some partial prints that are kind of questionable, but I, I have yet to come across any full prints that I could cast or say, yeah. That's that's definitely not human, you know. But after my father told me that, and he was emphatic that I continued to search because he he knew I had local associates with with video that that made the the rounds around the internet and television, and they're quite convincing. And and you you hear stories from people that live here and have lived here for many generations and you know these stories i believe to be are are 100 percent accurate and and true are you able to share any of those stories that have been passed around for generations or is that a thing where uh, we can't really well, talk about well that? M- most of what i've seen are are you know, glimpses at this thing, not so much, um, you know, long periods of time to observe them, but there's been people tell me they've, they've had one run across the, the road really late at night on, on some of these back roads. And for the people who are not familiar with how, how remote this area is, as far as, you know, there's some of these roads back here. There is literally nothing but trees and swamp and more water as far as you can see i mean people people think of florida is pretty well built up but the center of the state is is still primordial it really is it's a beautiful sight and uh, you know i encourage everybody to come and check out our state parks because there there are magnificent creatures out here to be seen by all and the skunk ape is, is an extremely rare creature, and people do see it. And there's, I have no doubt of that. What do you feel that the skunk ape is? Uh, what is it that you're you're looking for when you go out exactly? What well, personally, I feel I feel a connection with all uh, creatures. Not you know, it's not just the skunk ape as- aspect of it. When I'm out. I'm not just looking for skunk game. I'm looking for other rare animals also. But I feel a connection like deep in my soul when I look for these things because it to me it feels like maybe a a, a cousin or or some some kinship to it to humans. And it, it, it's it's hard to put in words, but I feel a, a spiritual connection there. And uh, you know I, I hope one day to be able to see one or at least get some really good evidence through, you know, footprints or or other means. Uh, you know, uh, the state is kind of restrictive about what you can and can't do in there uh, as far as, like, putting cameras up and things like that. You have to get permission, and they have to be uh, uh, put on a map, and, you know, the, the, the rangers have to keep, keep eye on things like that. So. Uh, it makes it a little more difficult because of that. So, you, you know, you, you, you're out there, you're going to have to experience it yourself or witness something that is enough for, for you to say, wow, this, this is it. This, this is real. And I think there's certain things that some people require and others are willing to, to, to take a feeling and a need 
to try and find these things. Oh, I agree. You know, once you've you've started to look for the creature, whatever that is, and wherever that is, uh, it's it's a thing that it's it's pretty hard to give up once you start looking for it. Uh, you also mentioned that there were acquaintances you had that had gotten video of the skunk ape. Uh, is Correct. that anything more Correct. you can go into? Uh, well, I, I'll I'll say this: the guy, the guy I'm referring to, he, he his video has has made the rounds on on various uh, you know supernatural shows and things. The funny thing is, and, and this amazes me a little, they always show just his video, never any of his snapshots that he managed to take because he he got really close to these, this thing, and. For whatever reason, they never use those, those snapshot photos he had. Now, keep in mind, the video he had, there was probably two dozen people standing there witnessing this. And if, if you go back and look at the video, and anybody that's familiar with Big Pudding or Skunk Ape probably knows the video I'm referring to. I, I don't want to say his name because I haven't spoken to him about this. Uh, but if, if you go back and look at the video, as the video begins, just to his right, there's, there's a young lady standing there with a massive camera. Now, what I'd like to know is what happened to her snapshots. You know, things like that, I don't know why go unnoticed or ignored, but the, I guarantee there are more uh, photos or videos of this thing from that same event. That's very interesting because I, I know I would, I would, I'm 99% that I know what video you're talking about, but it's interesting to know that extra information where there are other people there. Uh, and you bring up a good point what happened to what they captured. Um, if they're listening, contact me at Bigfoot Society at gmail.com. I'd love to hear that information or see what you had captured as well. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Get, get those videos, and, get those videos and, and photographs into this guy because it's important that we document these things. If they are as rare as I believe they are, they should be put on an endangered or a rare species list so people don't go out there and deliberately shoot these things. Something so rare and beautiful to be observed, not hunted. Mm. Hernando, uh, we'll we'll end with this. What what will it take for you to uh, to feel like you've reached your goal of searching for this creature down in Florida? What would be the thing that would have to happen in order for you to feel like you've reached your goal? For, for me personally, it would it would have to be a sighting similar to my father's or the gentleman that took the video I'm referring to. <laughs> His feelings on it was, you know, what he was saying was 100% real. It wasn't a bear. It was on two feet. It was human-like. And it did not want to be harassed. Hmm. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you reaching out, and this has been a extremely enlightening conversation. Some great encounter stories. Uh, if you, I'm sure that in the future, uh, once you're able to to find what you're looking for, I would definitely say, don't be afraid to reach back out to me. I'd love to talk to you again. But are there any uh, closing uh, words before uh, we wrap up this phone call? Yes, never, never give up. Anybody out there that that Bigfoot, don't give up. They are out there. You could spend an entire lifetime and only see one or none, but they are out there. Thank you, Hernando. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for listening to Bigfoot Society. If you like the show, please review and rate it five stars on iTunes. Hit the share button and send this episode to all your friends on social media. Subscribe to Bigfoot Society wherever you listen to podcasts. It doesn't cost a thing. Pick up a Bigfoot Society shirt or enamel pin over on our Etsy page and people will tell you all about their Bigfoot sightings when you wear it. At least that's what people tell us. That's what happens. If you'd like to become an official member of Bigfoot Society with a membership card, a community of like-minded individuals, and extra content each month, then please consider becoming a supporter of the podcast by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Thanks for listening.